Um, first, I have to apologize ahead of time. I'm not, I don't have very much experience with uh, giving talks, so there's probably going to be a lot of uh, ums and awkward pauses. So, <clears throat> um, I think first I'll just kind of show some recent work that I've been working on or that I've presented and um, and then maybe go back into kind of the theory behind it. So, <clears throat> okay, so this is uh, a presentation I did at Lista in the summer. Um, and it's kind of the beginning of the series that I started called the Premier Machinic Funerary Series. And, um, uh, yeah, so this was the prologue, and basically it's kind of, it's this commercial display, and it has these three vitrines in them, and they, and in the vitrines there are these 3D printed fossils, um, and they're kind of caskets, so it's kind of somewhere between a, a commercial display and a, and a funerary uh, display. Uh, this is the f this is technically the part one of the premier machinic funerary, which was in uh, at the Taipei Biennial in August or September. And um, for this one, we actually got a, a company in Taiwan to kind of, to design the space or make submit or uh, how should I say uh, um, yeah to design the space, and then we, wait, what is that word? <laughs> um, yeah, anyways. So this is the same, it's the same idea. And in this, uh, this 3D print is the skull of um, Paranthropus robustus that lives like two million years ago or something. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll just go back into it later. This is a show I just did in London. Um, this was part two. And for this show, uh, the, the kind of retail environment that I, that I produced, uh, I commissioned a photo shoot in, in New York with professional models and casting and everything to kind of recreate this uh, Bruce Weber, Abercrombie and Fitch look. And yeah, there's the vitrines again. Yeah, there was flowers and they kind of wilted over the course of the exhibition. Uh, this is a sneak preview. This is opening at Blaine Southern in London on Tuesday. It's like a group show. And the pink thing is mine. Okay, so <clears throat> to kind of get into like where I come from, from where I make my work from, it, it, uh, a lot of it has to do with um, kind of the central idea in philosophy, actually, this uh, central debate between idealism and realism. And uh, I'm sure you guys have heard, like, uh, in the last couple of years, like this term speculative realism or new materialism coming about. And a lot of these are actually, a lot of these uh, writers I'm really into. Um, so first to explain, idealism is not, has nothing to do with uh, political idealism. Um, and it has nothing to do with political realism. It's just uh, <clears throat> what it actually is. is <clears throat> um, realism is basically the belief in a mind-independent reality. And ideal, for idealism, for idealists, there's no entity that exists independent of the human mind. Uh, here's kind of some yeah, terms that are associated with it. So, so the, the big thing is that, you know, realism is an, is an imminent philosophy. 
uh, or has an imminent ontology that means that like everything, everything that exists is material, I guess. And uh, an idealist philosophy would um, maybe have a transcendental uh, ontology, meaning that, like for example, a good a good example is like Platonic ideals. Like if you think about uh, um, <coughs> like Plato had these ideas of like there was this perfect sphere or a perfect cube that exists in transcendental space and then all other cubes and spheres that you find in reality are just kind of imperfect copies. Um, and I, I think that this debate is actually really important because it ultimately has a lot to do with um, it, with issues like technology and climate change and ultimately ethics and, and art. So, um, let's see. Here's a uh, quote by Manuel de Landa. Um, now many of the problems facing humanity are caused by material processes that are not directly observable, such as the slow pollution of the atmosphere, rivers, oceans, or the slow degradation of human skills due to the spread of routinized labor and mass production. Idealists would have no way of dealing with this. As far as they are concerned, these processes do not exist. And positivists would also have to treat their existence as a mere hypothesis. So it may be due to the urgency of the material problems that we face, many of which escape direct experience, that realism could make a comeback. And this one I didn't print out actually. So <clears throat> this is from Levi Bryant, uh, who's I think really awesome. But um, so one way that, uh, one term for idealism is correlationism. So um, this, this is always the core argument of correlationism. Even as you're trying to think that that which is other than thought, you are still the one thinking it and therefore you can only think thought and never that which is other than thought. However, we really should question this argument. In interpersonal relations, there is a profound difference between the solipsistic narcissist that only ever hears their own meanings in their words of others, and a person that marginally begins to understand the world of another. We readily seem to grant that it is possible to understand something of another person's world, to grasp them in their difference, and that there is a difference between only ever hearing yourself in another and in hearing another. To be sure, we never fully grasp another person, but isn't there a difference between the man who only ever interprets women in masculine terms, in terms of his own experience, and the man that has some glimmer of understanding of what it's like to be a woman in this particular world, and vice versa? If we grant this, then why is it such a leap to suppose that we might be capable of understanding something, not everything, of the world of other beings? Isn't there a difference between thinking of cats in terms of what would motivate us if we were a cat and attempting to think about what might motivate a cat qua cat? So this kind of, um, this gets into like, you know, for example, bees only see in ultraviolet light. And the only way that we have access to bee consciousness is through, through science really. And, if you if you don't if you can if you can't take that as being real that a, a bee consciousness is is real then um, yeah I don't know I think that this kind of leads into a sort of like a tr a true basis for ethics somehow um, <clears throat> and then how this comes back into art is. Uh, uh, I think that it means that you know optical and formal and popular qualities are are non arbitrary um, n n and it 's not only ideology that cre that creates culture and images and aesthetics are also cr cross culturally accessible and that 's evidence that this is true <clears throat> and then you know it gets into cognition um, if you Think about you know how we process the world. Um, <clears throat> like for example, uh, there's this test or there's this uh, study that they did where they kind of showed people these um, images, random images, and what they were able to determine was that um, pictures of.
people and of body parts and faces um, and animals. Uh, the brain could kind of pick out quicker than, it, than tools or cars and, or just inanimate objects. And somewhere in the middle is uh, fruit and food. So uh, this is kind of my own interpretation of my friend Katya's work. She does a lot of these animal cutouts. <clears throat> um, and one thing that I'm really interested in is uh, the use of faces in advertisement and, and how we process faces. So faces are they're a unique mental category. Um, there's a certain part of the brain that's dedicated to processing faces. Uh, infants are able to recognize faces almost immediately when they're when they're born, and it's you know it's definitely something that has to uh, that's very uh, important for bonding with the mother. Um, people can have these disease, uh, this disease called prosopagnosia, which uh, they can't recognize faces, and they can <coughs> they can still determine things like gender and age and things like that, but they somehow can't recognize faces. I think Jane Goodall actually had this, has this. Uh, and then there's this uh, thing called pareidolia, which is when you see faces in things, like Jesus in a toast. Um, there was a study that examined how <coughs> portraiture changed from the 15th to the 16th century, and how it kind of went from this uh, from this sideways look to the direct gaze. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, direct gaze is attention grabbing. Um, direct gaze is more arousing as evidenced by galvanic skill, skin response. Direct gaze of picture, pictures of faces uh, are rated as more likable or attractive. Children as young as three days old uh, pr uh, prefer looking at direct gaze pictures of faces, uh, and then yeah, there's kind of the study, I don't know, I guess I'm not going to read that. Um, another thing is um, like mir mirror neurons, so this is a humunculus, which kind of shows like the density of nerves that we have in our body in, in, a, in a scale that's accurate, I guess, and I think like that's kind of the reason that we're seeing all this, all these hands and stuff, or ha actually uh, that's why we've always seen hands in art, is because it's something that we can, oh yeah, I, sh I guess I should explain, there's this thing called mirror neurons that um, <clears throat> in, in our brains that when we see somebody performing an action, the same action is performed in our brain, so um, just by looking at some, somebody doing something or somebody having a hand gesture or something, there's a part of that that we're also feeling. And so it just goes, so the thinking behind it is that something that has a higher nerve density is going to, you know, be more emotive of an image. Um, there's another study where they, they gave two groups of people uh, salty crackers, and then they had them rate uh, images, how, how much they liked images. And one of the groups they gave water to, and what they found was that the the group that didn't get any water, they consistently rated images of, of shiny things uh, higher. So I think that that's, so yeah, so it has to do with water. That's why we like shiny things. And that's why Jeff Koons is as big as he is. Um, <clears throat> wait, maybe I'm skipping ahead here. Um, <clears throat> oh yeah, I should, maybe read this as well. This is kind of going back to this idealist realist thing. Um, so, yeah. Um, on the other hand, the concept of power suffers similar problems. Not only does power tend to be deployed in an occult fashion to explain social phenomena, but it also suffers from the drawback of being overly anthropocentric in its connotations. The concept of power draws our attention to how narratives, signs, discourses, language, and human institutions are formative of social relations. It is not that this is wrong, as theorists Deleuze and Guattari, Jane Bennett, Manuel de Landa, Stacey A. Limo, and hosts of others have shown, but that these explanations are too restrictive. Social assemblages 
also take the form they have as a result of the distribution of rivers, ocean currents, disease epidemiologies, local resources, the configuration of mountain ranges, weather patterns, the distribution of natural resources, altitudes, and so on. The concept of power leads us to focus too exclusively on the plane of expression to the detriment of the plane of content. What we need to think, however, are the entanglements and interactions of machines from the plane of content and expression with one another. So this is just to illustrate kind of this, this central difference between thinking about things uh, from this more materialist perspective and thinking about things from uh, this more discursive textual place that art is kind of coming from and postmodernism is really all about. <clears throat> so now to get kind of back into my own work, uh, there's, kind of, there's some certain things that I'm really interested in, um, uh, yeah, in kind of making. Uh, the first one is vestigiality. Uh, I'm really interested in the, the causal descent of form. And that's not to say that I believe that there's always a one-to-one -one, uh, linear determinality of, of, uh, of things happening. Um, this was kind of the, the, the inspiration behind this series of works. I did this Axe Bottle series. So it actually started with this with the bottle itself, um, I really was, I'm, yeah, they're, you know, these ergonomic bottles and, and they're ridiculous and the whole advertisement campaign is ridiculous. Um, but I, I was fascinated to think that there was, you know, millions of years of, of evolution and of real events and of real beings' lives that kind of at some point turned into this product. Um, another thing that I, I'm really interested in is ex this concept of exaptation, which comes from biology. And it's basically, it's a trait that originally evolved for one thing and then it's used in another way. Uh, the classic example is feathers, which started as for dinosaurs to, you know, stay warm. Um, and then at some point it turned into being able to fly. Um, this is kind of key to this, this piece brand that I've been working with. Uh, I, I like this idea of just kind of taking these things that don't really fit together and kind of turning them into, or using them in some new way. And actually I'm also really super interested in, or genuinely interested in Taoism, which kind of at, at the heart is also uh, this uh, contingent philosophy that is all about change. Um, yeah, and contingency, um, so contingency being like accident and randomness and that life is, you know, ultimately a contingent material universe. Um, these are the, these are the 3D printouts, or these are just 3D models of them, of these 3D, of these bone scans that I showed at the very beginning of the, the red one. And all the bones are kind of all the bones of this one individual that lived, uh, around two million years ago as well. Like an 18 year old, uh, uh, yeah, Paranthropus robustus. Um, so yeah, you can see his teeth and bones and stuff. And, and how this relates to contingency, I guess, is uh, to create these, I simulated them scattering onto a surface in, th in three dimensional space, virtual space. And so I, I was kind of thinking that it kind of relates to you know, bone divination, you know, when you cast bones and you try to read something from that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so there's also this concept, this comes from Levi Bryant, this concept of the machinic. Um, and he kind of thinks that, he says that like everything, you can think of everything as a machine. Um, um, and ma machines are understood in terms of their operations. They, there's, they are transforming inputs, producing outputs. Uh, and all machines face entropy and they have to perpetually kind of perform operations to stay alive or st to stay intact. Um, like healing, like our bodies are healing or, or an organization needs to, I don't know, heal as well. Um, and you know, so every, everything from plants to a book, uh, a recipe, 
um, or the, a galaxy is a machine in that sense. Uh, oh yeah, here's, uh, here's another scan image of the, of the, one of the ones I showed in, actually in London, I think. And um, it, it also gets into this idea of acceptation. Like, I like this idea that I'm kind of taking this one thing and then kind of, like, or this one machine and I'm using it in a completely different way or it's becoming a part of another machine. And again, these are, they're scattered, the bones are scattered, and then I, I just mirror that scattering. Um, also, I'm really interested in material tendencies and capacities. So you know, this is the actual shower gel that, you know, comes, leaks out of these axe bottles from these swords. Um, and, uh, and they produce these, you know, beautiful fluid dynamic patterns and I, and I love this idea of like that the you know materials they kind of do their own thing and it's very aesthetic in a way and and I like this idea that culture is also material and it's also kind of producing its own patterns um, I, I melted yoga mats and uh, yeah, I guess melting points and freezing points are also really, has to do with the same thing. Yeah, it's the self-organizing behavior of matter, which is also <clears throat> what uh, Paul, Paul mentioned, uh, uh, Turing was working on kind of at the, at the very end, yeah. Um, one, oops. one category of machine that you can think of is an incorporeal machine. So I think, you know, in the art world, we're always talking about the immaterial. And I think that that's kind of confusing things because in reality, there is nothing that's immaterial. Everything is somehow embodied with and, and mediated through some sort of material even if it's just an idea or, um, yeah, anything. Um, I guess I'll read this. Uh, so, <clears throat> there are two considerations that lead me to resist the move of reducing incorporeal machines to corporeal machines. Iterability and identity. Unlike corporeal machines that are singular and always exist at a particular time and place, while also having a duration, incorporeal machines have the curious feature of being iterable while remaining identical. As an incorporeal machine, a novel scientific theory, mathematical equation, grammatical rule, recipe, political ideology, perhaps genetic codes, etc., can exist in countless corporeal machines, books, newspapers, magazines, symphony performances, brains, computer data banks, conversations, etc., while nonetheless remaining that incorporeal machine. Every copy or iteration of Shakespeare's Hamlet in the paper of a book or in a computer program is still Hamlet, just as every execution of the operation of the Pythagorean theorem is still the Pythagorean theorem, and every performance of Beethoven's Ninth is still Beethoven's Ninth. <clears throat> um, there's this concept of attractors, uh, kind of thinking about how, um, how systems are structured or how materials actually behave, but I think maybe I'm not gonna go too far into this. Um, and maybe, yeah, getting back into my work. This was at uh, Bana Kunstverein last year. Um, I've, you know, there can be a lot of criticism about this approach. Um, one of them would be this, the criticism of reductionism. Um, Levi Bryant has a great quote, uh, denunciations of materialism are gen generally premised on a highly tendentious concept of matter that is of the order of a straw man. The moment you hear terms such as mechanism or reductionism thrown about, you know you're before a 17th century crepuscular concept of matter. 
basically the theory of Democritus and Lucretius, understood as indivisible particles that enter into various combinations. This ignores work done in the sciences over the last 300 years, and in particularly the fluid and energetic nature of matter. Um, I didn't get so much into uh, evolutionary stuff, so maybe skip that. Neil, I guess I didn't go into that either. Um, ultimately, though, I think this work for me is, I have a, a, a spiritual motivation behind it. Um, I think, I, I don't know, I have, I, I think that reflecting reality or being very honest with reality is kind of the, the most, I don't know, spiritual thing. Um, and it's, and in that sense, I'm also really interested in, in Eastern philosophy. Uh, yeah. I guess that's it. Yeah. <laughs>
that I produced, uh, I commissioned a photo shoot in, in New York with professional models and casting and everything to kind of recreate this uh, Bruce Weber, Abercrombie and Fitch look.